I'll quickly talk about IFAD's investments for food security in the Arab world. Um, I'll start with this, which everybody know, is aware of in this room. This is a cereal demand and supply in the Arab world. And as we know very well, um, there's a big gap between demand and, uh, and production. It, a lot of talk has been this morning and just now, a lot of talk is how to increase productivity and how to have more production. But we know it will always remain far away from demand. Uh, Nadim Khoury this morning also mentioned there may be ways to to affect demand through education, through nutrition, and through um, family planning. But at the end of the day, no matter how we work on demand and on productivity, there'll be a huge gap. So in IFAD, not only we try to improve productivity, but we also try to find rural incomes for poor people in rural areas so they have the means to access food. So it's not based on only on production, but it's also based on access to food by having the purchasing power, by having sustainable incomes. We don't, in IFAD, we don't focus on education and family planning directly. Our main investments are therefore focused on um, managing natural resources and increasing agricultural productivity as far as production is concerned. Um, we also try to, as I mentioned, to get incomes for poor people through promoting rural finance and upgrading value chains. Value chains are mainly for cash crops, so it's not really related to food, pro uh, cereals production but it, it gets cash into poor people's pocket. And creating economic, economic opportunities, especially jobs. So if we can have sustainable jobs in the rural economy, this will help people to have uh, food security. And uh, we work through public-private partnerships, even though I won't go into that in detail now. On water management, we all know that the region is water scarce and getting uh, water is getting more scarce. Uh, there's, a there's been a huge decline in water availability per capita since the 1950s, and it's, and it's increasing. So again, um, rather th we have to focus on getting more, more output and more income per, per drop, but we also have to look beyond, beyond agriculture. As far as water is concerned, we, we focus on improved technologies, drip irrigation, sprinkler, bubbler, all the di different models. We focus on water infrastructure, mainly rainwater, rainwater harvesting, um, irrigation systems, primary, secondary, tertiary canal systems, and um, local institutions, which is very important, as we all know, the water user, users associations that manage the irrigation schemes. So these are the type of investments we make, soil and water conservation, rainwater harvesting, um, alternative water resources. We had ICBA, one of the representatives of ICBA here this morning, um, who, who we are working with on alternative water resources. Distribution and on-farm water use efficiency, which is probably one of the most critical areas. As far as land is concerned, we do some work on land, land improvement and management. Here's an example from Syria, where we've had a major investment with government of Syria on derocking which has created a lot more expansion in agricultural areas. So it goes back to the ICARDA presentation on how to increase the land available for agriculture. Even though the scope is not much, in some countries we could do this, and uh, Syria is one of the places where we are doing it. Um, also on rangelands, as we know, there's a lot of degradation in, in de and desertification also through climate change. Uh, we, do, we do a lot of work on rangelands and pasture areas through through uh, conserving the resource, uh, graze, uh, deferred grazing, reseeding, uh, shrub plantation, a lot of management of the resource by genetic improvement of livestock and um, veterinary services, and privatizing of veterinary services, as well as water availability we saw before livestock water points, and linking pastoralist organizations to markets. And probably that's the most fundamental part of it, empowering people to like, take their own situation in their hands. Coming to agricultural productivity, we know that in the region, uh, cereal yields are, yields are very low. Um, they're 50% of world average. After years and years of research, they're very low. And uh, productivity growth is declining, so the rate of improvement is reducing. So that's a thing to worry about. And um, on horticulture, the rate of growth is better than the national uh, world average, so that's something positive. As far as increasing productivity, we focus a lot on partnerships with, with ICARDA and other research and development organizations, but particularly with ICARDA, who's our main partner in the region, with improved varieties, improved management practices, uh, demonstration plots, farmers' field schools, as we heard before, and increased role of private sector in extension. 
and uh, input supply. Now I'd like to move on. So these are how we tackle productivity and production. I'd like to now move on to see how we look at uh, rural incomes and uh, people's moving out of poverty and access to food security. And we'll start with rural finance. We, we invest a lot in rural financial systems. And we have the whole range of rural finance from very low level saving credit groups to equity financing, and we'll, we'll cover these. Um, our rural finance policy uh, is summarized here. Um, we want to have a range of financial services, so not just credit lines or microfinance. Um, a range of financial institutions, so let's not just focus on one bank. In, in a number of countries in the region, we, there's one main agricultural bank, but why not bring in commercial banks, microfinance banks, other delivery channels, uh, which comes then to demand-driven and innovative approaches. Um, and they have to be sustainable, so the delivery channel has to be sustainable. We cannot make banks lose money because we want them to reach our, our smallholders. They've got to make money or else it won't work, it won't be sustainable. And finally, we look at the enabling environment for rural finance. This is a very simple model which is highly successful though. This is the village sanduk sort of system. We have it in a number of countries and it's producing great results. It, it, you know it's a typical model. You have the community sanduk. You have, it starts with members' savings, with group discipline. We put in some seed capital. Um, the income revolves, uh, the repayments revolve into re recapitalization and it's used for micro loans to members. These are for small loans in livestock, in agriculture, in off farm businesses. And the benefits, they're managed by communities, it's transparent, there's accountability, and there's uh, a lot of discipline. This is very successful. Here's an example from Syria. I mean, this data is, I think, a year or two old already. We, we have a, a lot of people joining, uh, putting their savings, $17 million being revolved, and it's expanding. Now it's taken over in a number of different areas in the country and other countries. Thank you. If we look forward, If we look forward, we have to see um, how to legalize the Sanduk as a financial institution. Right now, they're often operating in the informal economy without a legal basis, and that, may be, that is a problem. So we've got to formalize them. We've got to link them with, with services, financial services and, and other services. And usually this is done with apex organizations, which we've created in some countries. We're doing it in Syria now. And uh, new forms of capitalization, why not from the private sector? Why not from corporate social responsibility to capitalize village sandukes? But it is highly successful and the portfolio at risk is uh, over 30 days is less than 1%. So it's very good. This is something now refinancing. We do it in other countries of the region and we're trying to introduce it in, the, in some of our Arab countries. The beauty of refinancing is it brings financial services to poor people in rural areas, but it's completely financially sustainable. There's no burden on Ministry of Finance to pay back loans or anything. So in a typical case, we would lend money to a Ministry of Finance who would have a refinancing facility. This would lend to banks. Now, a number of banks would be pre-qualified. These could be microfinance banks, development banks, commercial banks, investment banks, equity, equity financiers. So anyone who's qualified by the central bank can participate as long as they meet certain criteria. They would lend to smallholders, they would lend to enterprises, and, and they would all be paid, and it would be paid back. So there's the, the, the banks would, uh, the borrowers would pay back to the banks, who would pay back to the Ministry of Finance, who would pay back to IFAD. So there's no debt burden on government for this. It's a self-sustaining steam, as long as there's good cash crops which, which are, are sustainable and viable and make the scheme work. This is how we move away from just productivity into actually getting incomes in poor people's pockets for food security. We're trying to, we're trying to introduce this in a number of countries now and we'll keep you posted. Um, I've already mentioned this, so I'll keep on going. Another avenue we're looking at now is equ equity financing. Believe it or not, we're starting equity financing now in Yemen. Um, equity financing is, uh, you know, you have a lot of rural businesses which are owned by families, by households, or by cooperatives, for example, fisheries cooperatives. Um, but they can't grow. They can't access bank loans. They can't access financing. They can't grow. And if they can't grow, then, there's, uh, then they're blocked at a certain level of development. So we can come in with an equity scheme where our uh, implementing agency would buy an equity stake in the business. That equity stake would come in with cash. It would expand the business. It would come in with a management package. It would come in with technical knowledge. It would come in with new markets. And um, so businesses can grow. 
Why do we want these agribusinesses to grow? They create jobs. And coming back to food security, we need to create jobs for poor people in rural areas, and this is one of the great avenues to do that. There's a lot of worldwide experience with private equity, which is nothing new, so why can't we use it for development purposes? We're doing it now. Um, it's based on value chain approach, and again, cash, cash crops where there's market demand, growth potential, and uh, job creation effects. And there's a huge amount of economic benefits. Uh, we're, we're, going to, uh, we're going to do this with coffee and fisheries in Yemen. We're doing, we're start, we may start with uh, livestock and horticulture crops in Morocco, and horticulture is a good place to do this, for example. Now moving on to economic opportunities in rural areas which go beyond productivity, we're looking at value chains which have comparative advantage, market demand, and growth potential. And these are agriculture, livestock, fisheries, but also non-farm. In Yemen, again, we're investing now in the natural stone sector, where there's a huge export market and a lot of comparative advantage. It creates a lot of jobs. Um, Handloom textile sector also, which creates a lot of jobs for women in rural areas. This is supplemented by a broad range of financial services, not only debt financing, but equity financing, refinancing, um, why not micro, micro leasing, why not insurance? So there's a different models we're using. It's very important to supplement and upgrade um, these value chains with market-derived infrastructure. So these are not infrastructure for the common good, like big water schemes or roads, but these are specific infrastructure for specific value chain to upgrade that, such as storage, electricity, irrigation, and targeted uh, sort of infrastructure. It's fundamental to have producers or associations and, and contractual linkages, and we'll come to that later. These are the type of services we provide, um, services for smallholders, which are basically global gap training and compliance, range of financial services, business services, climate smart technologies, in collaboration with ICARDA, of course, producer associations, and so on. Also, rural labor market intermediation, where we have to intermediate between the supply of labor and the demand for labor in the rural areas, where there's often a mis mismatch between skills and demand. And services for enterprises, most importantly, HACCP and ISO, um, compliance and certification. This is now uh, how we do value chain development. This is not a theoretical model. This is based on 12 years of operational experience of IFAD, and this is what works. And we're doing, we've done it worldwide. We're starting to do it in a number of countries in the region. And this is really successful. Um, and this summarizes what I've said before. We finance agribusinesses. We finance producer associations. We support that forward contracting mechanism, which banks use as collateral. Um, it's all linked to markets where there's demand. Um, the services we provide to the businesses are sort of financial business, HACCP compliance. The services for smallholders, particularly training, global gap compliance, technology, producer associations, and market-derived infrastructure. We're now doing this again with coffee and fisheries in Yemen. We're doing it with horticulture and um, almonds in Morocco. We're doing it with horticulture in Egypt. We're doing it in a number of countries. And this is highly successful, and it gets in sustainable incomes into small producers' pockets, which increases their food security. It also creates a huge amount of rural jobs. Two minutes. Okay, okay uh, this, this now, we try to summarize what are the, what are the results, what have we produced in the, what are, have we produced today in the region? It's really hard for us to get one of our deficiencies is impact data, what have we produced. But these are some of the big numbers. We know we're, our portfolio today is valued at $930 million in 10 borrower countries, borrower and recipient countries, of which $450 million by us and um, $480 million by domestic and external sources. We're reaching 2.9 million poor people today at a cost of $52 per person. And if we divide that by 12 months, it's like $4 a month. It's a bit more than $4 a month. We're reaching 2.4% of the rural population or 6.5% of the rural poor in the countries which we're working, which is a huge number and which makes us think that if we get 10 times more money, we'll reach like almost all the rural, rural poor in our countries. I've been asked to go quickly, so I'll just, I won't read. These are some of the sort of other results we have in terms of land management, irrigation schemes, um, community organizations, training, and so on, road constructions, savings and credit groups. Finally, partnerships. I didn't talk much about partnerships, but it's one of our main, our main priorities. We have partnerships with co-financing partnerships with a number of international and regional partners, 
and a number of uh, knowledge partnerships with a lot of institutions which are here today. So I'll stop here. Thank you.